Thank you. Uh, your uh, welcome here has been very warm. The hospitality, absolutely phenomenal. And so I certainly want to extend my thanks uh, for the warm reception that I've had in coming here. Uh, but uh, what do you say we give our attention here to the Word of God, and let's uh, bow in a brief word of prayer before we hear the reading and then the preaching of the Word. So let's bow together and pray. Father God, we give you thanks uh, for your Word. We give you thanks that you have not left us alone in this world. Not only have you given us your Holy Spirit to teach us all things, but you have given us your Spirit to teach us all things by your Word. So we pray, O oh Lord, that as we look back upon the shadowlands of the Old Testament, that you would enable us to see the Lord Jesus Christ clearly with the eyes of faith, that you would open our eyes and our ears, uh, that you would enable us to hear his voice, and that in hearing his voice, we would uh, yield and we would submit to his uh, commands, that we would believe in his promises, and by your grace, uh, you would further sanctify us and conform us to the image of your Holy Son. We pray and ask all of these things in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Let's open our Bibles to Psalm chapter 8. And though uh, we had the privilege of singing it uh, just a few moments ago, it's helpful for us uh, to uh, re, you know, refamiliarize ourselves with this uh, well-known text. And so let's uh, turn to Psalm chapter 8 and let's give our attention to the reading of God's Word. Psalm 8, uh, beginning in verse 1. Hear now the word of the Lord. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens, out of the mouth of babes and infants. You have established strength because of your foes, to still the enemy and the avenger. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him, and the son of man that you care for him? Yet you have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor. You have given him dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen and also the beasts of the field, the birds of the heavens and the fish of the sea, whatever passes along the paths of the seas. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth." May God add his blessing to this reading from his holy and inspired word. Beloved, I think one of the things that we want to understand as we come here to the 8th Psalm is to appreciate a little bit of the context in which we find it. In particular, we're quite early in the opening Psalms of a very large book of the Bible, as we know that it has some 150 Psalms. However, what's interesting about the first eight psalms in particular is that the first eight psalms in many ways mirrors the overall structure of the entire Psalter. In other words, when we look at the psalms, we shouldn't think that it's simply some sort of rag-bag collection of odds and ends that have been slapped together with a little bit of glue and maybe a little bit of thread. Instead, it has been ordered in a very specific and particular way to convey a message. And I think that we find uh, a miniature version of that message here contained in the first eight psalms. And that if we look, for example, at Psalm chapter 1, which we also sang uh, this morning, Psalm 1 speaks of the man uh, who is righteous and whose uh, good works flourish in season and out and who does not sit in the seat of scorners and stand in the way of the scoffers and he doesn't dwell among the tents of the wicked. What we have to recognize is that Psalm 1 is not just simply a generic statement about humanity in general, but rather the Hebrew there indicates that there is one man in particular, one man in particular. And if we look further down into redemptive history, we can understand that the one man in particular is the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the one man who indeed was completely righteous, who did not stand with the scoffers, who did not sit with the scorners, who did not dwell among the tents of the wicked. Rather, he was obedient and completely obedient to the will of his Father, which it is therefore no coincidence that Psalm 1 immediately segues into Psalm 2. Psalm 2, where we have the Christ, 
the Messiah, who is identified as God's anointed, the one who was to be installed on Zion's holy hill, the one to whom all of the nations were supposed to bow down and worship and kiss lest they be found to fall under his wrath. Psalm 1, and the obedient man gives way to the enthronement of the obedient man, the one who is identified as the Christ, the Messiah, Jesus himself. I think, and we can say, that David himself looked forward uh, to the enthronement of his greater son. Because we know that God the Father promised to King David in 2 Samuel chapter 7 that he would uh, place one of his descendants upon the throne and that this descendant of his would reign forever and would have an eternal kingdom, which is why we find, for example, in Psalm 110, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. David knew that he was writing ultimately about the Messiah. And so here too, he was writing about the Messiah. But yet, we find a peculiar turn in that we ascend from the depths, if you will, in Psalm 1, where the righteous man is surrounded by the wicked, and he ascends the throne and he uh, takes his seat next to the Father, and he reigns over the nations, and we think this is a moment of triumph. This is a moment of glory. And then we seemingly, from that high plateau, descend back down into the valley. Because in Psalms 3, 4, 5, 6, and 7, they are marked by darkness. They are marked by persecution. They are marked by the psalmist crying out, saying, O Lord, where are you? Why have you seemingly forsaken me? Why do you not hear me when I call to you? I think in many ways, this pattern of ascension to a high plateau and then dropping down into the valley of darkness, if you will, in persecution, in many ways mirrors the life of King David himself. If you recall, King David was out in the shepherd's fields uh, tending to his flock when Samuel came along looking for the one who was to be anointed as king. And he looked over his brothers and said, well, these are fine strapping young lads, but... uh, These aren't the young men that I'm looking for. Do you have another? And they said, well, why don't you call the runt in? Call in David. And so they called him in and said, yes, this is the one. Can you imagine being a young boy being called in from the field and all of your older brothers being passed over and the holiest man in the land coming to you saying, you are to be anointed king. And here the holiest man in the land goes and anoints you as king to be crowned over the entire people of Israel. I would suspect that that would be a pretty highly emotional moment, a moment where you are so excited and thrilled. But yet, on the heels of that emotional high, what happened? David descended into the valley because he was now being persecuted and even was fearing for his life Because Saul, the wicked king, was now pursuing him, trying to throw spears at him, chasing him down to the point where David had to flee for his very life. And in fact, many commentators believe that in many ways this is what is going on here in Psalms 3 through 7 with these cries for, uh, you know, that God would descend and would help the psalmist, that he would help David, that he would deliver him from his foe. Yet, in the midst of this darkness, in the midst of this persecution and trial, David ascends out of the darkness once again. He ascends out of the darkness and he looks here to the words that we find written in Psalm 8. He ascends out of the darkness and prays and thanksgiving 
and joy fill his heart as they overflow in great abundance. Praise for his faithful covenant Lord. Why is it that David was so filled with praise? Why was it that he could ascend out of this seemingly uh, treacherous time where someone was out trying to kill him and men were hunting him down like an animal, and yet he could still find his heart filled with praise, or he could uh, write with his quill, if you will, O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Now that is indeed the question of the hour, is it not? So let's consider how it is that David could look upon these words and how he could utter them even though he was in the midst of this darkness, even though he was in the midst of this persecution. I think one of the chief reasons that David was filled with joy is found immediately in the opening verse. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all of the earth. David knew his covenant Lord in a very intimate way. The fact that you see, O Lord, in all capitals in your Bible means that the Hebrew beneath that word is the name of God, Yahweh, or Jehovah. And it is no small thing to take that name upon your lips. If you recall from the Old Testament, the first person to whom God revealed his name in redemptive history was Moses. I think in our own day, perhaps at least in our contemporary setting, uh, we find it very common to call people by their first name. I remember when I was growing up, and I promise I won't descend into when I was younger, and things were better. But I remember when I was growing up, my parents always taught me, never call anybody by their first name unless you are specifically invited to do so. You call them Mr. So-and-so or Mrs. So-and-so or Pastor So-and-so unless you are specifically invited to do so. Because to call somebody by their first name is an act of familiarity. It is an act of intimacy. It is an act of privilege. It is not one to which you are automatically entitled. I think in our own day when we're used to saying, hey, you, hey, dude, come here. Maybe such things uh, don't work as well for us, but imagine if you were to be in the presence of the President of the United States or of, the great, of a great king. You would never dream about calling this person by his or her first name. That would be uncalled for. That would be being too familiar with someone in high rank of authority. And yet this is precisely what David does. He puts upon his lips the name of his covenant Lord because indeed God had embraced him. God had loved him. God had set his favor upon him and said, Yes, you, David, may call me by my name. But though David calls him by his name, O Yahweh... He still recognizes that Yahweh is his Adonai. Yahweh is his Lord. O Yahweh, my Adonai. O Yahweh, my Lord. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all of the earth. He had an intimate relationship with his covenant Lord and thereby knew that he could call upon his Lord not only in times of trial and persecution, but also, as the Apostle Paul might say, in times of plenty or in times of want. And I think as David began to reflect upon the grandeur of his covenant Lord, he was inevitably drawn out to the broader creation. I think so often it can be the case that when we look upon our own circumstances in life, we can think of nothing else but our own circumstances. And in one sense, that's completely understandable. Sometimes life can be all-consuming. It can seem as if life around us is trying to drown us. But yet I think David had a broader perspective He undoubtedly was well aware of the people who were out trying to kill him. He was undoubtedly aware of Saul's zealous hatred for him. But I think he took the time 
if you will, to look upward, to look to his covenant Lord and to recognize that in many ways his existence what was but one small piece in the, in the greater cosmos, in the greater creation. And it caused him, therefore, to reflect upon the greater creation and what he saw there, which we see in verse 4. What is man that you are mindful of him, and the son of man that you care for him? I mean, something that I suspect that David was undoubtedly aware, but perhaps we, uh, through the window of modern science, have perhaps a greater appreciation for, is the vast immensity of of the creation that is around us. I mean, as I was flying in on the airplane the other day, I was just amazed at all the beauty that I saw around as we were coming down in for the landing, the mountains uh, and the valleys and all of the different colors. But as you can, for example, now go out to the old internet and you can uh, look at photos from faraway worlds that are millions and millions of light years away. And we find out that as... uh, amazingly beautiful and uh, large and expansive as this world is, it is but one small, tiny, infinitesimal speck in what we know is the greater universe around us. You know, they talk about traveling to Mars and how many years it will take, and I just think... You know, it's just a small infant step, if you will, when you look at the broader uh, universe around us and how many billions of galaxies there are out there. Uh, at this point, you've, you've reached the extent of my scientific knowledge because everything else comes from Star Wars and it's not very accurate. <laughs> it's not very accurate. But you get the idea. You get the idea which in the broader context of this vast universe, God has deigned to create human beings and he has crowned these human beings with honor and with glory and has invested these human beings with his very own image, something that no other creature in this world shares. What a tremendous privilege. I mean, we often think of the angels, for example, uh, and we think of them as these mighty and wonderful and powerful creatures. And indeed they are. But yet, it is not to the angels that God has given his image. It is not to the angels that God has invested with glory and honor. He says in verse 5, Yet you have made him, that is, man, a little lower than the heavenly beings, and crowned him with glory and honor. I think in this vast creation, David was drawn back and given this great sense of awe of the privilege, the great privilege that he had as one of God's creatures made in his image, crowned with glory and honor. And I believe that filled him with a great sense of hope, with a great sense of confidence and assurance that even in the midst of his struggles and in his trials, uh, God was watching over him. Indeed, if he who created everything that we see here and now and that David saw before him, he therefore knew that a few people chasing him were very insignificant in terms of God's abilities and he could most certainly protect him and keep him safe. And so this, I think, for this, one of these great reasons here, this is why David is just effusive with praise and thanksgiving to God. And so again, he closes out the psalm there in saying, O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all of the earth. Now, I think in many ways we can see great reason as to why David would be filled with praise. Why David would be able to look into the face of trial, of suffering, and of persecution even, and still uh, sing the praises of his great and faithful covenant Lord. But at the same time, 
I think perhaps to a certain degree all of us maybe scratch our heads a little bit. Because as we read this psalm, we know that what David is ultimately reflecting upon is he is reflecting upon the initial creation. As the psalmist says here, as David says, what is man that you are mindful of him? You've crowned him with glory and honor. Uh, You have set him and you have placed all things under his feet. You have placed him over the birds of the air, the fish of the sea, the beasts of the field. In other words, David is reflecting upon the creation of Adam and Eve and that that grand text that we find in Genesis 1, specifically in verse 28, where God gives dominion to humankind, when he gives dominion to Adam and Eve over all of the creation. And we scratch our heads and we think, well, I can see how David would be impressed with this, but isn't there a slight sense of mourning? Wouldn't there be a little bit of reason to be filled with sadness. Because as great and as wonderful as all of these things are in the creation, we all have that nagging knowledge that Adam fell. That Adam fell. That he forfeited that place of glory and honor that God so graciously gave to him. So how is it then that David can still lift up this truth, the truth of man's creation and his uh, enthronement over the creation, his investiture uh, with glory and honor? How can he still hold this up and it not just be uh, David longing for the good old days? That can be our tendency sometimes. There was an older gentleman in my congregation I used to talk with on a regular basis. We used to go out for coffee on Friday mornings. And uh, among the many stories he would tell me, uh, he would tell me about one occasion where he blew up a whale. That's a story that I'll have to wait for another time. (laughs) It was an interesting story. It's not one that most people can tell. But he would always say, John, in my day, it was better. Things in this country were better. People were more wholesome. Sin was not tolerated. And to a certain extent, I can understand exactly what he was saying. At least I had a good idea. Well, beloved, this is not what David is doing. David is not just longing for the good old days. Saying, oh, if it could only be like that. Rather, it may not be immediately evident here. What David is doing is he is ultimately looking to the future. This is a future hope that David holds on to, that David embraces with his faith. If you will turn over to Daniel chapter 7, because David is not the only one to talk about Psalm 8 in the Bible. Daniel chapter 7 is one of those slightly mystifying passages of Scripture. It's mystifying uh, because so many people have come to it and they say, well, this is obviously talking about the end of all things. Let's try to figure out exactly what's going on. Let's see if we can clock this one out. Let's see if we can calculate when the end will come. Let's see if we can decipher who precisely Daniel is talking about with each one of these visions. Now, however interesting those things might be, sometimes I think when we look at a passage like Daniel chapter 7, we miss the forest for the trees. You see, Daniel saw a vision in Daniel chapter 7. He saw a vision where he saw four fierce and ferocious beasts come up out of the water. Verse 3, four great beasts come up, came up out of the sea, one different from another. The first was like a lion, verse 4. Verse 5, another beast, a second one was like a bear. Verse 6, after this, and behold, 
another like a leopard with four wings of a bird on its back. Verse 7, after this, I saw in the night visions and behold a fourth beast, terrifying and dreadful and exceedingly strong. These four beasts are ferocious and they are tearing up everything in their path. You may not realize it, but what Daniel is looking at is he's looking at a visual picture of Psalm chapter 8. But the problem with it is that it's turned on its head. You see, the Son of Man does not have all of the beasts of the field, the birds of the air, the fish of the sea beneath his feet. They are instead running rampant all over the creation. It is Psalm 8 turned upside down. But blessedly, this isn't the end of the vision. As I looked, verse 9, thrones were placed, and the Ancient of Days took his seat. His clothing was white as snow, and the hair of his head like pure wool. His throne was fiery flames. Its wheels were burning fire. A stream of fire issued and came out from before him. A thousand, thousand served him, and ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The court sat in judgment, and the books were opened. Yahweh pulls up on his chariot. I'm paraphrasing. And what is it that Yahweh has to say as he comes upon this scene where the beasts of the earth are running rampant? I looked then because of the sound of great words that the horn was speaking. And as I looked, the beast was killed and its body destroyed and given over to be burned with fire. As for the rest of the beasts, their dominion was taken away. The beasts had dominion, not the Son of Man. But Yahweh pulls up and he tears away their dominion. And then what happened? Verse 13, I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like a son of man. What is the son of man that you are mindful of him? There came one like a son of man. There came one like Adam. And he came to the ancient of days and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away. And his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. Yahweh comes and takes Psalm 8 and writes it. He says, I am going to restore my authority in the creation. No longer shall the beasts have dominion. I have taken it away. And one like the Son of Man, one like Adam, shall come. And he will come, and to him I will give dominion over the beasts of the field, over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the air. And his dominion will be an everlasting dominion. No one shall overturn it. It shall be forever and ever. Daniel sees Psalm 8 upside down and then righted by God in his vision. So that, beloved, I think the chief reason as to why King David could glean so much hope from Psalm 8, even in the midst of his own struggles, his trials, his persecution, was because he was looking to the future. He was looking to the enthronement of the Messiah, the reign of his greater son, who would right all wrongs. He was not simply just dwelling upon the good old days of the past, but rather he was not only dwelling upon the past, but also dwelling upon the future in recognizing that God himself would establish the reign of the Messiah in the creation and he would right all wrongs. He would push back against the dominion of the beasts, if you will, the creation run riot, and he would once again rule as God had intended man to rule over the creation. So when we think about this, all of a sudden, hopefully, pieces of the puzzle fall into place. When Jesus 
was coming into Jerusalem. And he was riding on the foal of a colt. What did the children cry out in the streets as he came? Hosanna! Hosanna to the son of David. Hosanna to the son of David. Don't let it pass you by that they identify, the children of all people identify that here is the son of David. Here is the Messiah. Here is the one of whom it is written in Psalm 2, kiss the son lest he be angry. Here is the one of whom it is written in Psalm 110, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Here is the one of whom it is said that one of your descendants, King David, shall sit upon the throne, your throne, and rule forever and ever. The children cried out. The children saw it. The Pharisees, Pharisees didn't see it. They did not want to acknowledge it. And what did the Pharisees do? The Pharisees told Jesus, what are you doing? Tell them to be quiet. They obviously don't know what they're talking about. They're mere children. And what does Jesus do? He quotes Psalm 8. Matthew 21, verse 16. Have you never read? Out of the mouths of infants and nursing babies, you have prepared praise? The psalmist, King David, recognized that even out of the mouths of infants and babes, God had ordained praise. And indeed, what Jesus is saying is, in not so many words, is Psalm 8 was written about me. I am here. I am the Son of Man. I am the one of whom it is prophesied in the book of Daniel that he shall turn everything as it was supposed to be. I am the one to whom is given dominion and power, and glory, and an eternal reign that will never be overthrown. This is precisely the connection that the New Testament at so many different points makes. In the book of Hebrews, chapter 2, verses 6 and following, it has been testified somewhere, what is man that you are mindful of him, or the son of man that you care for him? You made him a little lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor, putting everything in subjection under his feet. Now, in putting everything in subjection to him, he left nothing outside his control. At present, we do not yet see everything in subjection to him. But we see him who for a little while was made a little lower than the angels, namely Jesus, crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death, so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. Whatever uh, hint of mourning that we might have in reading of the glory of the creation uh, and knowing of Adam's fall, we can look upon it with joy because we know that one like the Son of Man has been made a little lower than the angels and has tasted death for all of those who look to him by faith. That we no longer have to suffer the consequences of death because of what Jesus, the Son of Man, has done. The one to whom dominion has been given. Again, the Apostle Paul, another portion of the scriptures in Ephesians chapter 1, says this in verses 19 and following, that what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe, according to the working of his great might, that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named, not only in this age but also in the one to come. And listen carefully. And he put all things under his feet and he gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. In his resurrection, God the Father places all things under the feet of Jesus. Psalm 8, beloved, is a prophecy, ultimately, of the reign of Jesus. But wait, there's more. Paul, in that famous passage of Scripture, uh, 1 Corinthians 15, where he talks about the resurrection, there, as he reflects so eloquently and beautifully upon the resurrection, 
he talks about the resurrection of Jesus. And he says in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 25 and following, for he must reign, that is Jesus must reign, until he has put all his enemies under his feet. Quoting once again Psalm 8. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. For God has put all things in subjection under his feet. King David knew that his greater son would come and would restore all things. Not only righting all wrongs, but he would himself, through his own life, death, and resurrection, and ascension to the right hand of the Father, he would defeat death itself, our great foe. So that even when David were to die, he knew, he knew that God, through Jesus Christ, one like the Son of Man, would raise him from the dead. That was David's hope in the midst of his struggles and trials. That was his great hope, even though he knew he was anointed king and had all of these blessings, but nevertheless suffered so greatly at the hand of his persecutors, it is that hope of the reign of the Lord Jesus to which he looked. Well, beloved, what was a distant future hope for David is a present reality for you. You no longer wait for the enthronement of the Messiah. You no longer wait for the advent of Jesus in the flesh. For he has come and he has vanquished our foe. He has defeated our great enemy, Satan. And he has conquered sin and death itself in his life, death, and resurrection. And he is now seated with Christ, or seated with his Father at his right hand. And you, beloved, as Paul tells us in Ephesians chapter 1, are seated with him in the heavenly places in Christ. That truth, beloved, the prophetic truth of Psalm 8, should fill your hearts with hope. This Tuesday, there's going to be a national election. Frankly, I'm tired of hearing about it. The story in the news of how a four-year-old girl was in tears because she was tired of hearing of the election. Tired of hearing of Bronco Obama and uh, Mitt something or other. I forget what she called him. Beloved, no matter what happens, nothing changes the fact that Jesus reigns. No matter what happens in our nation, it will not change the fact that Jesus reigns. If you face persecution, if you face trial, if you face illness, or even look into the dark face of death itself, nothing changes the fact that the Lord Jesus Christ reigns and that he protects you, he defends you, and he holds you fast in his nail-scarred hands. And that he has tasted death for all of us so that death would not have the final word, but so that Jesus Christ, the word of God, has the final word. That, beloved, those truths should fill your heart with praise so that as the Apostle Paul says, whether in plenty or in want, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. It is that hope to which David clung, and it is that hope to which, beloved, we, as the people of God, we who are united to Christ, must also cling. For in the face of life's trials, there is no other place to go. There is no other place to go, save but the mighty wings of the Lord Jesus Christ beneath which we can take shelter. If you have any doubt, read Psalm 8. And then read Ephesians 1. Read Hebrews chapter 2. Read 1 Corinthians 15. And see that the hope of Psalm 8 was the hope of so many of the authors of the scriptures. And in the end, beloved, pray that the Lord would fill your hearts with praise that in looking upon these truths, 
you too can cry out with King David, O Yahweh, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. How majestic is the name of Jesus the Messiah in all the earth. Amen. Let's pray. Father God, we are grateful that you are kind and merciful to us in ways beyond what we could ever ask, imagine, or think. And that we who rightly deserve your judgment and condemnation for our sin have instead been bathed, as we have heard earlier, with the blood of Christ. We have been washed and cleansed through the work of the Holy Spirit. And so we give thanks for this wonderful mercy that you have given to us and we have so undeservedly received. We pray, O Lord, that you would give us the eyes of faith, that you would continue to enable us to hold fast to the promises that you have given to us in Christ and help us to remember that in him all of your promises are yea and amen. We pray, O Lord, for those who have yet to trust in Christ, that you would open their hearts, that they too might find shelter beneath his mighty wings so that in the face of trial, persecution, suffering, illness, uncertainty about the future, that we would not be fearful, but rather we would instead be filled with hope, the hope that caused King David to cry out with praise, O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. We pray and ask all of these things in the mighty name of Christ. Amen.